SPJIMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership presents its podcast series called Past Imperfect. I'm Dinyar Patel, a professor of history at SPJIMR. Past Imperfect is a new podcast series where I will be in conversation with authors of some of the most exciting new books on Indian and global history. This series highlights India's connections with the wider world looking at how india both influenced and has been influenced by other countries and societies professor tinyar patel is in conversation with historian ram chandra guha thank you ram for being here on this inaugural episode of of past in perfect your most recent book rebels against the raj uh, portrays seven non indians who became indians and fought for their adopted country's freedom we'll talk about this book as part of a larger discussion about biography and and uh, biography yeah. writing in india but i want to begin with something a little different a question about your career trajectory and i ask this because whenever i talk to a lot of my students here at spjmr i get a sense that many of them do not know what they're doing in the sense that you know at least for the undergraduate education family and peer pressure pushed them mostly into engineering even though many of them had little interest in engineering or or little desire to pursue engineering uh, after the the education uh, in the mbas they're on a bit more of a firm footing but still many of them don't know what precisely they want to do and one student had actually told me frankly you know every day is an existential crisis now in your case i know that you know you had uh, started off at least in 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 the delhi school of economics doing a degree in in economics and then you pursued uh, sociology as a phd in i am calcutta and only then did you get to history so i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know these these shifts in your career and whether you encourage other indians to do the same dinya i in my when i was growing up i was born in 1958 so i in my generation you finished high school at 15 or 16 now you have an extra year and often that extra year makes has quite an impact on clarifying your decisions as to what you want to do so i was 16 when i had to decide what to do at university i come from a family of scientists i was moderately good at science but not excellent and i didn't want to study science at university because i was told i was passionate about cricket and i was told that if i registered for a science degree i would labor i would have laboratory exercises in the afternoon and i could not go for net practice so <laughs> so i had to so i had to do humanities now at 15 and a half i was already interested in writing i had I had won a essay prize in school i might have thought of doing english literature but that was a kind of unfashionable subject and in the even more patriarchal india of that time english literature was a subject that girls did before they got married uh so i stumbled upon economics and i stumbled upon economics partly because i had a cousin who was a well known economic historian uh, the long time editor of the indian economic and social history review professor dharma kumar also editor of the cambridge economic history right, and right. so somebody in the family had made a sort of career as an economist but i knew nothing about economics when i registered for my first degree at st stephen's college and within a month perhaps even within a fortnight i knew that economics and i were spectacularly unsuited to one another i had no aptitude for economics and you know that was really the problem because economics requires a kind of an abstract analytical mind and i did not possess that i have a empirical uh, you could say humanistic mind but you know once you register you carry on and uh, i was playing cricket for the college i was running the college quiz team i had wonderful friends there was a good library and i drifted through college happily and did a ba and i had a i mean one of the things i'll tell students is uh, it helps to have un- indulgent and caring parents and after i finished my ba i knew economics was not to me for me but i wanted two more years of university life i wanted at the joys and the pleasures of living in a hostel with like minded people playing the game i love two games i love which was cricket in the day and bridge at night you know one a more physical game and the other a more mental game and i told my father i said appa can i have two more years of university he said sure he said university is not only about grades i actually had a middling second class in my ba in economics and i carried on for an ma really just to have two more years of university life and through a series of accidents which i won't go through here in the course of my ma i discovered the writings of veria elvin who was um, an oxford scholar an englishman by original nationality who came to india and joined gandhi and then left gandhi and became the leading ethnographer and activist for india's adivasi people and wrote a series of very moving books and portraits about adivasi life literature 
culture, their struggles, their anxieties, the oppression and discrimination they faced, and so on and so forth. And he was a wonderful stylist. So here was scholarship, but that was appealing, engaging, and moving. And uh, so I said, okay, maybe sociology and anthropology is for me. And then I was fortunate that I am in Calcutta, which uh, disregarded my second class degrees and was kind of indulgent and gave me admission. It had a small, unfashionable, uh, not at all celebrated program in the social sciences. Uh, so I'm glad I'm speaking uh, at a management, at a business school, because although I do nothing connected to business, it was a business school that gave me a second chance in life. Now, so I then started a doctoral degree in sociology. Uh, and uh, my uh, doctoral research was on the Chipko movement. I began my doctorate in 1980. A few years earlier, a peasant environmental movement, quite celebrated since, called the Chipko movement, Chipko being, being the Hindi word to hug, which involved peasants in the Himalaya, men, women, and children, stopping commercial loggers from destroying the Himalayan forest on which they depended for, for sustenance. Uh, uh, what's going on, and I began my research on Chipko, and I realized then that Chipko had a past, that from the 19th century onwards, hill peasants, Uttarakhandi peasants, had been protesting against the state usurpation of village forests, and I went to the archives, and I fell in love with the archives. Now, I am a historian who carries some traces of his sociological training. I think in many of my works, uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, they're based on archival research, but there's some attention to structure, to process, to sociological categories like caste and class and race and gender, which come really from my sociological training. So my work as a historian has residues of my education as a sociologist and absolutely none, no residues from my non-education as an economist, even though I have two degrees <laughs> in economics, there's nothing remotely I learned from them uh, which I've conveyed in any of my books. So I'm a sociologist turned historian, is how I would, turned biographer, is how I would describe myself. I had a similar difficult experience with economics when I was in college, but for, fortunately, I didn't pursue it as, as my main topic of, uh, of study. Uh, like you, I, I think, you know, the importance of understanding parents, I, I think, is, is very important. You know, I, my, I, came, I come from a family where many, many of my, uh, you know, I mean, my, my father and many of my uncles and such are, are engineers, but there was no pressure at all for me to go into engineering. And I assume for you also, right? There was no pressure for yeah. engineering, even though that was the fashion of the day. Science, actually, uh, in my case, it was science, my father and grandfather, several uncles, mm -hmm several female cousins had PhDs in either physics or chemistry and oh, had become professors. Excellent. And there was no pressure to do science at all from, from my parents. Hmm. Good, good. So um, I, I think that this is an important point you bring up also in the sense that you know, many of the important historians we have uh, don't necessarily have, you know, the, the textbook historical training. Right. And in the sense that many of, you know, I mean, you don't really have to have a history PhD and go through the, the rigors of, uh, you know, methodolog methodological training in order to be a very good historian still. I mean, you can pick up. I mean, the, the one thing I like about history is that it's it's very approachable. And, and really, you know, if, if you put your mind to it and you put time into it and, and you know, yeah. as, as you said, you 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 have that relationship with archives, you can Correct. go on to build a, an excellent career as a historian. Yeah, the, I think the key phrase is you was you put your mind to it and put your time to it. So you have to pay your dues in the archives. You can't write history on a, a work of history based on published books written by other people, still less on what is called internet research. You have to muddy your hands in the archives with old documents, manuscripts, reports, uh, committee uh, inquiries, uh, newspaper accounts, uh, oral histories, and much, much, much else. So uh, obviously, it's uh, one can. Self-trained to be a historian uh, uh, is much harder at the age of 28 or 29 to self-trained to be an engineer or a doctor. But you could do it. But you have to pay your dues in the archives. And you Absolutely. have to uncover material no one else has either seen or understood before. And that's what makes, makes a work of history compelling. And I love working in the archives. And I actually, uh, in retrospect, uh, the long hours I spent in the archives... I think in, are in partly enabled by the long hours I spent in the cricket field, which I also enjoyed very much. You know, so if there's something you like, you're willing to engage with it so thoroughly that the hours, the minutes and the hours pass and you don't really know because you're so absorbed in the material you're finding in the archives and the notes you're transcribing.
I entirely agree. I mean, my my time working in the archives when I was doing my PhD was was hands down the best experience I had in in my in my PhD experience. Perhaps the best experience I've had in academia in general. It was something I fell in love with immediately. And you know, I'd I'd, I'd wake up every morning excited to go in and see what finds they were there. And and in India, as as you mentioned, you quite literally get your hands muddy <laughs> because a lot a lot of the material just is is you know has not been touched for for decades. And uh, yes, I, I I think that the excitement, you know, even though archives in India have their challenges, I think the excitement exciting thing about working here is that unlike say in the British library uh, things are not picked over uh, the, 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 there's lots of material which is you know has been uncovered has not been uh, uncovered before and, and is you know you oftentimes are the first person reading that material since it was composed absolutely yeah yeah so getting back to you know this this issue of you know we, we have so many students for example at SPJMR who've had engineering training at, at the beginning of the of their careers what what do you think India is losing out on by this the single minded focus in many ways um, on uh, engineering and straight jacketing so many smart talented people to go into engineering and I'm sure there are, there are lots of people of course who who have a, a distinct interest in it but there are many also who do not what what do you think India is losing it out on uh, uh, in you know not I have not ha- devoted much thought to that uh, partly mm-hmm. because. I have not. Neither of my children have become engineers. One is a novelist, and the other is a is a social entrepreneur. My wife is a designer, so uh, I don't really interact with many engineers. So I've really not devoted much thought to that. But I'd say this: that I think these specialist schools that were set up, business schools and engineering school, engineering colleges. It it's important that okay, they were set up for a particular purpose. You needed lots and lots of engineers. India was an emerging industrial economy in the 50s and 60s, and you wanted to train people to work in steel and cement factories and the construction industry and so on. And you started all these engineering schools. Now, I think it's important for these schools, at least now, to have a humanities component in the education. It's true of of business schools like the one you teach. I'm very grateful that I am Calcutta had both had a PhD program, a small PhD program in economics and in sociology. And, like, and, and certainly SPGN should at some stage think of, you know, it's good that history, sociology, um, communication are important elements of business education. So I can't answer the question as to why people want to do engineering. But if they get into an engineering school or a medical school, expose them to all branches of human knowledge, of course, engineering preeminently. But if you can teach history and sociology and culture and literature and film studies in an engaging an appealing way, uh, you'll become better engineers too, and better doctors and better lawyers too. So I think narrow professional schools, uh, which only, whose curriculum is exclusively devoted to that specific and narrow subject, are I think very 20th century and should really rethink their, them, themselves and their curricula uh, in today's world. And I think it's it's good that in in some cases places like the IITs are branching out more into humanities and are instituting liberal uh, you know liberal arts uh, programs and such. Even though of course the, that's not being reflected in the the entrance exams, right? The IITGs you still have that's to study a mix but of good. scientific. But you're right. Subjects. I mean they have some good good programs, good 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 scholars, and it's good that they're expanding in that direction. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, let's let's hope this trend continues. So um, I, I'll, I'll transition now to uh, the topic of biographies in general, which is which is something I want to talk to you about. Since you know you of course have written several biographies, and I've recently written, written a biography on Dada by Naroji as well. Uh, now, uh, almost twenty years ago, uh, you had you had written an article in the Times Literary su- Supplement, which was uh, titled "The Bear Cupboard," where you you, you talked about how in in India and, and in South Asia in general, th- there's just a, a, a a dearth of, of, of good biographical work. Uh, the, the biographical yeah. genre has not been taken very seriously. Uh, and consequently, you have huge, important lives. I mean, people like Sardar Patel, for example, uh, right. who, you know, ha- have very few or, 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 or in many cases, no uh, proper academic, uh, you know, life studies to their name. What, what do you think has changed or what has not changed in, in the, the 20 years since, uh, since you So you, I think you uh, this? things have changed. And uh, largely for the better. I mean, this, in fact, I think it may even be, it came out in 2000 or 2001, that I say, so it's more than 20 years. I, I, I'm not sure which issue of the TLS came out, but early in this century. So the two decades, one is, uh, among the things that have changed, is that there's a growing market in India of non-fiction readers who want to read history and also biography. So when I started out in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the craze was all fiction, you know. People 
outside their work read novels. Now they want to read history and biography as well. So there's a market and writers and scholars have to respond to it. And they have. Uh, and the response can take uh, several forms. One can be popular writers basing themselves on secondary sources and uh, telling the story anew in a attractive and less jargon-ridden fashion. So you know, have a lot of interest in biographies of you know emperors, you know, Hindu and Muslim emperors of the past. So that's one direction in which biography writing can go, which is fair enough. A second direction is ideological works, justifying a particular left wing or a right wing thinker. And the third direction, and the most enduring and the most valuable, uh, in um, in my view, is works based on deep and original research in the archives, learning the languages if necessary, and uh, uh, having all the rigor that scholarship commands and the detachment and objectivity that a scholar must have, not serving a certain political agenda, not writing to please a political party, not having your photograph taken with the prime minister or the chief minister while promoting your book, which is, in my view, a, a unfortunate trend that uh, that is now occurring where young writers want to become famous very fast. So I think in the third category of biographies, those not written with an ideological agenda, those not written uh, solely on the basis of secondary sources, but those based on rich and original research and a perceptive uh, frame of analysis and an elegant writing style. Uh, you know, and I, your work on Naroji, of course, Ruby Lal's work on Nur Jahan, uh, the, uh, Supriya Gandhi's work on Dara Shiko, Saman Subramanian's work on J.B.S. Haldane, uh, are some of the examples of, uh, I'd say, uh, the cupboard not being bare at all, no, no longer being bare. The cupboard filling up. Much more needs to be done because India has had an extraordinary, rich, and interesting and tumultuous history. A history peopled with remarkable, unusual, eccentric, uh, controversial, heroic characters across the sphere. You know, scientists, artists, musicians, politicians, generals, demagogues, saints, scoundrels. Biography, uh, it should really be a true growth area in Indian history. It's becoming that. Uh, in terms of high quality works of research, uh, it's no longer a bare cupboard. When I wrote that essay in uh, 2000, uh, I would say that um, there was, at that stage, there were some competent political biographies. So there was uh, B. R. Nanda on Gokhale, Rajmohan Gandhi on uh, Rajaji, uh, S. Gopal on Nehru. There were a few competent political biographies, none of which were at all probed the personal or the human side of the politician concern. You know, biography is about the personal and the public. It's about a human being's achievement and a human being's struggles. It's about their uh, political or business relationships, but also about their family relationships and their friends and rivalries. So if you look at biography in this rounded way, as a work of literature and as a work of social science, only there was only, I would say, one first-class biography written by an Indian when I wrote that book, and that was S. Gopal's biography of his father, Radha Krishnan, hmm. which was more frank, more revealing, more intimate, uh, and more open uh, and more objective than his biography of his Nehru, uh, by hero Nehru. So when, when Gopal wrote about Nehru, uh, he was not willing to admit many faults to Nehru, and he really wrote in a very uh, scornful and patronizing and sometimes even pejorative way about Nehru's rivals. Whereas when he wrote about his father, he was he had learned from the mistakes about uh, how he wrote about Nehru, you know, trying to portray his hero as a hero. So when he wrote about Radha Krishnan, he examined Radha Krishnan's extramarital affairs. He examined the criticisms of Radha Krishnan's philosophy as being superficial and trite. And it's a much better book for that. So I'd say there was just one book that uh, in two, 20 years ago, there was one book that would meet the highest standards of achievement so far as biography went, that could match what was being produced in France or Germany uh, uh, or, or America or England about major historical figures of those countries. And now there are at least half a dozen or a dozen. So the cupboard is no longer bare, but it, it has to be peopled with uh, many more interesting characters. And I'm sure that that's what will happen uh, in, the, in the years to come, that biography will continue to be a growth area because Dinya readers want to engage with individual lives. You know, uh, readers want to, a book on debates on tribals, uh, analytical scholarly debates on tribals, in which incidentally Elvin was one of the participants, versus a biography 
of Elvin, which opens up a window through his personal life into debates on tribals. Most readers would prefer the latter way, uh, uh, latter approach. Uh, any day, and uh, you know, I mean, you you talked about uh, Gopal's work on his on Radha Krishna. I think it's it's all the more extraordinary given that he, he was his father, and you know, he he could write with that sense of detachment, which which is very difficult for for I think any biographer, right? I mean, you develop a certain uh, you know rapport with your subject, and sometimes it can be very difficult to get that that lens of uh, of you know a, a critical lens on on your subject as well. Um, so I, I I agree with you in the sense that I I, I do think the, the the cupboard is filling up. I mean, we're, we're still. I, I know a comparison with a place like the U.S. Or, or the United Kingdom is unfair, but was was still, I think, miles away from anything close to uh, what what it yes. could be. I mean, you you go to, I mean, the United Kingdom. I mean, even when I was researching Nauruji, uh, the amount of information I could find on Nauruji's whereabouts in in England was was spectacular. I mean, I I would talk to say. Um, you know, members of, you know, the, the National Trust or such uh, who uh, would, you know, show me the, the precise address and, you know, the floor plans and, you know, maps from the 1890s, which would indicate the houses that he lived in. And, and here in, in India, uh, in Bombay, uh, both, you know, I mean, all the houses associated, associated with Nauruji are gone and there's no trace of them and no one knows where they were. Um, so, I mean, a small example, of course, but I mean, you, you go to a place like the US, for example, and you have non-academics, right? You have people like Robert Caro who have spent... Yeah. Yeah, decades, right, researching the lives of one figure, uh, Johnson, uh, and now in his 80s, you know, he's just finally getting to the presidency. It's, it's a remarkable story. Um, yeah. You know, what, what are the obstacles towards creating an environment like that in India? I mean, obviously, one obstacle, again, is just, you know, I mean, the places like the US and the UK are at a socioeconomic level where people can devote their time and attention, but there's, there's more to it, I think, also. Yeah, before I answer that question, uh, let me just add... Uh... Uh, to the list of high-quality biographies being that have been written in India and alert your listeners to two books that are forthcoming. One is the first good biography, well-researched, deeply researched biography of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, India's first non-Congress, and uh, first BJP Prime Minister, written by um, Abhishek Chaudhary. Uh, and the other is a very insightful study of the maverick socialist politician George Fernandez, who, of course, lived for many years in Mumbai. And both are first-rate works of scholarship, which I've had the privilege of reading in uh, in manuscript, and they should appear in the next year or two. So, uh, so just to you know, give a heads up to these uh, fine works that are you know uh, in process. Now, there are many many obstacles to writing uh, good biographies. One is, of course, that Indians are rather careless about artifacts and documents. They don't keep papers. Uh, see, Ambedkar, there are four or five biographies of Ambedkar now in the works. I hope uh, they will fill the gap. But they, you don't have a massive collection of Ambedkar's papers the way you would for Nehru or Gandhi. Uh, and for many other people, you know, they just papers just won't be there. Uh, you know, for extra, uh, or you would have lack of access. You know, if you wanted to write a life of J.R.D. Tata, there are few hagiographic works commissioned by the Tata Trust or the Tata group of companies. But if an independent scholar wants access to everything J.R.D. said and wants to write an objective work on his life and legacy, you'll find barriers. If you want to write about, uh, you know, say the RSS ideologue Goldwalker, the RSS will, I'm sure, put hurdles in what you can get. If you want to write about a Marxist like EMS Nambuti Park, the same thing. If you want to write about Indira Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi will not allow you access to all the papers for fear that you will cast a, a light on some of uh, the, uh, the critical mistakes she made. So we are very, Indians are a fearful, possessive people when it comes to the documentary record of their ancestors. Either they don't have it, or they don't want to share it, or when, uh, or they're extremely touchy. Uh, so if you write something critical about Subhash Chandra Bose, every Bengali will be up in arms, for example. <laughs> so I think these are some of the hurdles, but they're not insurmountable. They are not insurmountable, and they are, again, if I may give one more example, I've been reading also, um, uh, as it turns out, uh, some other, maybe we can talk about it a little later, because this is part of the series I'm doing called Indian Lives, some young scholars writing about individuals who have not left private papers, but who have been able to get around this by looking into the uh, other kinds of archival, source, archival sources and the collections of other people. So... It's much easier for multiple reasons to write a biography of a, of a British or American or French or German f figure because those are documentary cultures. 
those are cultures that respect, preserve, collate, and make accessible important historical documents. And we aren't really a documentary culture. But these hurdles are not, as I said, they're not insurmountable. It's ironic in many ways. I mean, we're, we're paranoid about the legacies of particular individuals, but we don't preserve, you know, the, the paper trail that at least can, can uh, or, or, or we're paranoid about control about, about that, uh, you know, the particular yeah. uh, documents. I mean, Nehru is a, is a fantastic example, right? I mean, you know, if, if, if I were to want to look at Nehru's papers, I need permission from the trust. And especially if I want to look at the papers post-47, I need extra permission. I, mean, I remember Absolutely. writing letter after letter at, at uh, the, the Nehru Memorial Library asking for permission. And, and what you get ultimately is not really what you, what, what you wanted to get. Um, so, so, um, you know, Indians seem very good at one thing, though. I mean, they seem very good at writing hagiographies, um, you know, uncritical, uncritical, worshipful accounts of particular people rather than nuanced biographies. I mean, do you, do you think there's something cultural about that? Is it, is it, is it, you know, even, you know, I've often thought about whether it's even a hangover of the Victorian era where you had the influence of people like Thomas Carlyle writing about individuals as heroes. Is, is it more than that? I think it's both. I think it's all of that. It's also fear of giving offense. Uh, and, you know, uh, 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 Ambedkar famously said in his last speech to the Constituent Assembly, he said, uh, Bhakti in religion is a road to the salvation of the soul. Uh, bhakti in politics is a route to eventual dictatorship. But he said Indians are particularly prone to Bhakti. And we are. It's not, of course, in the sphere of politics. So I mentioned both. Uh, but you can't criticize. You can't say anything remotely critical about Shivaji in, in Maharashtra or about Periyar in Tamil Nadu, or about Prithviraj Chavan in, 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 in Rajasthan, or whatever, right? So, and living people too. I mean, our politicians are worshipped as gods. And that's true, not just, there's a cult of personality, not only around our prime minister, but around several chief ministers as well, around our cricketers, you know, uh, uh, around our film stars. So we are a deferential and reverential and hero-worshipping people. And I think we have to escape that, at least scholars have to escape that, have to transcend that, to grow out of that if they want to write biographies that endure and that are really worthwhile. Unlike in many countries, I think biography can be a genre in, that in India at least is dangerous. I mean, for, for biographers, I mean, you yes. know, people have faced actual attacks and institutes have faced attacks also, which is something obviously which, you know, you do not get in many other countries. Um, I, I, one of the stumbling blocks, which I know, I know you have talked and written about quite a bit and which I share a lot of your opinions about also is, is, is academia. I mean, academics in general have kind of turned their nose up at biography. Uh, I know, I mean, I faced some opposition, not a lot, but but some opposition uh, from, from peers and such when I chose to write a biography for uh, my dissertation. And I know you have in the past encountered a lot of opposition also from academics. Um, do you see attitudes there changing? And, and, you know, why in particular do you think South Asian academics have been so resistant? I, in that essay I wrote 20 years ago, I speculated that South Asian ac academics in general... Um, are hesitant to uh, encourage biographies because they think it's giving too much importance to an individual. They think social structures and political processes matter more. You know, uh, social science dominates rather than the individual human being. But in India, I argued in that essay of very long ago uh, that there may be two additional factors. One is our dominant religion, Hinduism, where the individual life is not memorialized because you've been born as something else. And the other is, of course, now, fortunately in the past, the dominance of Marxism in the best Indian history departments. And Marxists disparage biography because individuals don't make history, class struggle and technology does, right? So, according to them. So, fortunately, that has passed. I don't think Marxism dominates. It hasn't necessarily been replaced by the most appealing or ideological alternatives, but let that pass. Uh, but there is this prejudice against writing biographies in the academy because you are, it's, it's, it's kind of um, not regarded as kosher to focus on one person. You have to focus on something larger. You know, you uh, should not be writing about, for example, since you're in, uh, you're in Mumbai, uh, let me give you the name of a person who's been absolutely forgotten to most Mumbaikers today, but had a profound influence on the life of a modern Maharashtra, but there's a street named after him. He was a man called Acharya P.K. Atre. He was a writer, a newspaper editor, a film, film director, and an ideologue of the Sabhita Maharashtra movement. And through his life, you can tell the story of 20th century Maharashtra and all its controversies, its upheavals, its 
emotional uh, uh, content, its cultural, literary life, political life. Now, if uh, someone goes to the Bombay University Department and says, "I want to write on Bob, uh, history department," and says, "I want to write life or write life or write a life, uh, write a life of P.K. Atre for my PhD thesis," that person is likely to be told by her supervisor, "No, write about the Maharashtrian press in the 20th century, and you can have a chapter on Atre." Or write about the Samyukta Maharashtra movement of the 1950s, and you can have a chapter on Atre. But don't write a whole book on Atre. Write on something larger. So I think this is the kind of um, diminishing of the individual life, even when the individual life speak, speaks to so many interesting and important social and historical events as the life of Atre does, or the life of Naroji did, uh, and so on, and, and, and so on. So I think there is still a prejudice in history and sociology departments in India and elsewhere. And it's not an accident that many of the best biographers, you mentioned Richard Caro, but if you look at England, people like Hilary Sperling, Victoria Glendinning, Claire Tomlin, Richard Holmes, David Gilmore, A.N. Wilson, some of the finest British biographers don't teach in universities. You know, so it's, that's probably not an accident. I agree. I agree. And in, in many ways, at least here in India, the tragedy of the individual is that many of them get reduced to, as you said, street names or chokes or, or metro stations. There's, there's a metro station coming up, which will be called Acharya Atre uh, Chok. So that, okay. that, that, that is his legacy at the moment. And I entirely okay. agree. I mean, someone like him needs uh, more engaged proper study. Um, I want to turn to your, your first proper work of history, which is your, your biography, biography of Elwin. And in, in many ways, Veria Elwin seems like the, the ideal or a dream subject for a biography. I mean, someone who, whose life was filled with about faces and, and sudden turns. I mean, it's, it's hard to think of many other individuals who started off in, a, in evangelical Christian, um, you know, uh, milieu and, and ended their life uh, studying Adivasis across central India and you know, having rejected both Christianity and, and, and Gandhiism as well. Um, and you mentioned in your work that um, reading Beria Elwin changed my life. Uh, how so? And, and, and beyond just, you know, changing your vocation to looking at history, in what other ways had it, uh, what did it oh, have I think a transformative effect? Essentially that, that uh, I moved from economics to sociology and uh, then I started reading him. And then I, my first book, as I explained, was on the social history of forests. And although it was set in the Himalaya, whose peasants are Hindus, not Adivasis, Elvin has written a great deal on similar processes in central India, where the state usurpation of forests had dispossessed and angered the tribals who had often rebelled against this. So, and he wrote very movingly about forests. He wrote poetry and folklore about the beautiful forests of what is now Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. Uh, then I got interested in Gandhi, and Elvin had a very interesting and complicated relationship with Gandhi. You know, he was first a devotee, then he was a critic, then he was kind of reconciled. Uh, so wherever I went, Elvin was there, and I thought I should finally settle my accounts with Elvin and write a biography. And at that stage, I had published three or four books. It was not my first book. Unlike with you, Dinyar, your first book was a biography. I had written... Um, uh, three works of uh, environmental history already, environmental and social history already. And I was trained as a sociologist, and it was an extraordinarily difficult, literally challenge to me to move from, as I said, structure, which is what sociologists write about, to process, which is what historians write about, to the individual human being, which is what is the focus of a biographer. And I'm normally a relatively fluent writer, you know, uh, and my work does not go through many iterations or revisions. But my biography of Elvin went through six or seven revisions, and I had um, two teachers, informal teachers, who helped me become a biographer. One was my editor, Rukun Advani, then of the Oxford University Press, who had a PhD in literature from Cambridge, and was very sensitive to style and, and, uh, and nuance and human emotions and relationships. And the other was... Uh, a colleague, uh, 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 an academic colleague when I spent a year in Berlin, a man called Nicholas Boyle, who's a professor at Cambridge, now emeritus, and was the biographer of the great German polymath Goethe. So through them and through their, their reading my drafts, I learned how to, you know, become a biographer. So in terms of the struggle I had, so my life with Elwin was enchantment and then, of course, struggle. And that, uh, I think I grew a lot as a writer and as a scholar with Elvin, 
in the many years I spent with him. In, yeah, you mentioned in your, your book uh, that, you know, looking at a, a person like Elwin allows you to see the, the other side of the Raj. Um, and I, you know, I mean, what, what, what exactly is that other side of the Raj and, and why is it important to, uh, uh, to show it? Well, the other side of the Raj is um, those white people who worked and lived in India and were guilty about their sense of privilege. Unlike the civil servants and the generals and the tea planters and the stockbrokers and the missionaries who felt entitled and superior and had come here either to exploit Indians or to civilize Indians. Uh, here were a group of people of whom Elvin was one uh, who were much more ambivalent about their privilege, who came not to exploit or to enrich themselves or to aggressively convert but to understand, empathize, and eventually perhaps serve. And had I not written on Elvin, I would not have written my latest book, which is about seven such characters. Uh, oh. So and I think I've always been interested in these boundary crossers. And in my new book, I talk about, for example, why South Africans who resisted apartheid as also being of that type. They could have taken their privilege for granted. They could have reaped the benefits of being a white educated professional in a state run for whites. Instead of which, they recognized that apartheid was an evil and horrible and, uh, and illegitimate regime. And they had to oppose it and break, break bread with and identify with and struggle along with the Africans who were uh, uh, fighting to dismantle apartheid. So I mean, uh, this is something that attracts me, you know. Uh, Upper caste reformers who work for the emancipation of Dalits. You know, I'm now, this is again maybe uh, deviating a bit from um, uh, what you want to do, uh, but it's kind of linked. I have become fascinated in recent months with an ancestor of mine who was my father's paternal uncle, my paternal grandfather's elder brother, a man called R. Gopal Swami Ayer, who was a Brahmin who devoted his life to the emancipation of Dalits of the erstwhile Mysore state and brought in progressive le legislation, started schools for them, campaigned for their rights, for them to be treated as equal citizens of uh, Mysore state. And uh, so I've, those who take the other side, you know, the other side of Brahminism, a man who fight against patriarchy, you know, the other side of, of, of malehood, so to say, you know, straight people who fight for the rights of, of queer people. Now, all this, I think this is something that has become a kind of... Uh, almost an obsession with me. I'm, you know, these kinds of people who are traitors, honorable traitors to privilege. You can call them traitors to privilege. Uh, in whatever sphere, uh, uh, you know, I find them interesting and fascinating and worth writing about. And it's remarkable how many of, of them there were. I mean, at least in, in my own work on Naroji, I mean, you encounter uh, well-known individuals like like uh, an Alan Octavian Hume or William Wedderburn. And in Hume's case, you know, he actually, quote unquote, identified as a native um, by the end of his life. He, he studied Hinduism. He associated more with the, the political ambitions of, 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 of Indians within the Congress. But there, there are countless others whose, whose names are, are forgotten. Uh, who, uh, you, you know, populate the archives and in many ways, uh, you know, really provide nuance to an otherwise rather nationalist dominated account of how India won freedom. Um, I, I think in many ways also your, your book on Elwin shows, you know, if I will, the, the other side of Indian nationalism in the sense that, uh, you know, from, I mean, we're familiar, of course, with, you know, a Dalit perspective or Dalit critique or an Ambedkarite critique of nationalism, but less so with, a, you know, the perspective yes. from, uh, you know, an Adivasi or a tribal account in the sense that it shows how, you know, how in many ways Indian nationalism could be almost culturally imperialist or, or you know, hegemonic. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, Elvin broke with Gandhi and the nationalists particularly because uh, they regarded Adivasis as backward Hindus and not as having their own distinctive culture and ethos and literary and philosophical and artistic traditions. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I have one more question before we get to your, your book, Rebels, Rebels Against the Raj. Uh, how is your experience writing your two-volume work on Gandhi different from, from Elwin? I mean, obviously, you're dealing with completely different uh, subject matters, different sets of archives, different perspectives, different trajectories. Uh, what were some of the key critical differences? Well, one, of course, is that two, two, several critical differences. One is Gandhi is a much more histor important historical figure. Uh, a second is there were ma many books already about Gandhi, whereas... Um, uh, uh, you know, the, mine is likely to be the first and last biography of Elvin. Uh, because Elvin ultimately was an interesting minor figure, but of course, uh, uh, interesting, the emphasis on interesting rather than minor. 
Now, but there were many similarities. What I learned from writing on Elwin, I brought to writing on Gandhi. One was look for uh, Gandhi like Elwin was a prolific writer. So do not rely only on that person's writings. Look for sources that other than those emanating from the subject. Go beyond the collected works. Look for letters written about Gandhi, to Gandhi, around him. Look for what is said in newspapers, in government documents, in intelligence reports. So expanding the, uh, the net of sources, uh, uh, which is what I learned from writing on Elwin, who wrote 40 books and 500 newspaper articles. I like many people write on Gandhi based on the collected works. I could have written on Elwin just based on what he had left behind. So that's one, obviously, methodological lesson I learned uh, from Elwin, which I applied to Gandhi. A second was a biography is only uh, as compelling as its cast of secondary characters. So Elwin's relationship with his two wives, with his Oxford teachers, with his Indian colleague Shamra Hiwale, with Gandhi and Nehru, are what enrich your biography. You know, too many biographers just concentrate on that one guy or that one woman they're writing about and don't bring in. A biography is more like a, a play people by many, many, many individuals. You know, your main subjects, friends, associates, rivals, colleagues, enemies, family, interlocutors, uh, and so on and so forth. So that, and I, and I think my book on uh, Gandhi has, brings in many people, interesting people, I believe, who are not there, who have not given their due in, uh, uh, in earlier works on Gandhi. And if I may just mention four, two men and two women. In the South African phase, uh, the Jewish pair of, of course, the couple, Henry Pollack and his Christian wife, Millie Pollack and Gandhi's Jewish secretary, Sonia Sleshin. And if I was come to the Indian, Indian phase, Mahadev Desai, Gandhi's great secretary, who was actually more important to Gandhi than Nehru Patel or Bose, and Sarla Devi Chaudhrani, Tagore's niece, the poet with whom Gandhi had a brief but very intense and revealing infatuation. So I think it's from Elvis that I learned these lessons. One, look for sources other than what the, your subject has left behind. Uh, Flesh out the secondary characters and the important relationships because it's in these encounters with other people that your principal subject most fully reveals himself. And finally, don't be deterred by the fact that your subject is written an autobiography because, as I say, I think in the epilogue to my Elwin book, an autobiography is a preemptive strike uh, against a future biographer. Elwin wrote an autobiography telling his version of his life trying to preempt what, setting it out there as his authorized version before any busybody came around. And Gandhi did the same thing with my experiments with two, which of course doesn't cover his whole life. It stops in about 1920. And my experiments with truth is a work of great literature. Of uh, It's a landmark work taught in business schools, by the way. I'm told it's taught in business schools in America. I don't know about uh, SP Jain. Uh, it's gone through so many editions, so many translations. But there are lots of things Gandhi leaves out. Sometimes deliberately, sometimes one, uh, you know, um, accidentally. So the lessons I learned from writing on Elwin, what I learned about uh, the different elements that make a good biography, uh, you know, I think certainly helped me when I wrote on Gandhi. The secondary characters, that, that's something which, which I encountered, at least in my work in Nauroji. I mean, when I read Nauroji's letters, oftentimes they were quite staid and, and succinct and to the point, but the letters that really kind of jump off the page were those of secondary characters. In my case, people like Deramji Malbari or, or the, the British um, uh, socialist Henry Hinman. Uh, it's remarkable how, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, when I was reading these letters that were composed in the 1880s and 1870s, you could, you could feel the force of their personality much more than, yeah. say, the principal subject I was working on. So um, let me let me turn now to your book uh, Rebels Against the Raj, and you, you know in, in your introduction you've you've compared uh, your rebels <clears throat> um, with uh, foreigners who in the 1930s joined the the International Brigade on the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War, and and interestingly there is an Indian connection there, as you as you probably know in the sense that uh, the British regiment was was named after Shapuji Sakradwala, the, the the Indian communist. Uh, yes. But you, you you've said the following of of your rebels quote This story remains much less known. Uh, although it is in some ways more remarkable, uh, the foreigners who fought in Spain stayed for the most part within their racial and religious boundaries, whereas the freedom fighters of my narrative turned their back on their compatriots to identify with people who are neither Christian nor white, end quote. Why has the story been so little known, uh, even within India, especially within India? Uh, I, don't, I can't really answer. I mean, it's like, it's easy to tell a story of exploiting whites and resisting browns, you know? It, that's kind of a neat narrative 
uh, that fits into everything. And, uh, you know, and of course, it feeds into the rising jingoism and xenophobia we're witnessing today, or two. But it was always like that. I mean, as I say again in my, in my, uh, in my epilogue, uh, there was a book written in 1972-73 uh, when we, on the 25th anniversary of our independence, it was written by, published in Bangalore by a liberal called P. Kodanda Rao. Uh, and it was called Foreign Friends of India's Freedom. And it was short essays, originally radio talks with that title. So the early 1970s, we weren't so close-minded, parochial, xenophobic. At least someone could give a series of talks and write a, not a scholarly book, a popular book, of these foreign friends of Indian freedom. And uh, now, of course, uh, all whites are bad and all Indians are good, you know, more or less, except those Indians who work with what, the whites, you know, who are Mir Jafars or whatever, traitors or whatever you want to call them. And mm. these, these seven characters who I read about, uh, and there would be others too. The some I leave out because my boundary condition for inclusion in this book was they had to go to jail or be deported. So I couldn't include Sister Nivedita or C.F. Andrews, for example, or Laurie Baker, the Quaker architect who transformed the landscape of Kerala. But I hope uh, that my new book, that readers are attracted by the lives, seven extraordinarily interesting, compelling, engaging individuals, but also by the larger lessons about how India once en dealt with the world and how it can still deal with the world today. Do, do you think there were any commonalities or common traits that, that united these people? I mean, you, you know, it, it seems in one sense that many of these people were, were misfits in their own society. I mean, I'm thinking of someone like um, Sarala Devi, who was born, as you said, to German parents in England around the time of World War I. Uh, Benjamin Horneman, of course, who was, who was gay. Uh, Samuel Stokes, who was a Quaker, who grew up probably in one of the most jingoistic periods of American history. Uh, what, what, what united these, these figures? So I think seven distinctive lives, but are you right? I mean, they were in the, what it united them was they were questing, open-minded, seeking to break free of the conventions and shackles of their culture, maybe seeking a sense of romance and adventure. Uh, they lived in different parts of India. They did different things. Uh, they also were, of course, had other things that unites them. Is at this I found only in the course of writing this book. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't uh, anticipated this when I began researching the book. Uh, and this is that all had very interesting uh, engagements with Gandhi. You know, hmm. some were reverential, some were adversarial, some were a mix of uh, attraction and repulsion is how they approached Gandhi. And Gandhi was, of course, the most important figure of India at that time. So it's not unexpected that all of them encountered Gandhi personally, ideologically, emotionally at some phase in their lives. But... There are seven distinct lives, and I try to interview them. And you know, the readers uh, have come up with so and so was my favorite. No, so and so was my favorite. And obviously, you know, there are seven distinct people united by throwing in their lot with uh, the cause of a country that was not there. And uh, I mean, you know, the the difficulty I imagine you'd encounter in, in in writing about these seven different people is in the sense that some of them are very well known, right? I mean, Annie Besant has that that famous two volume biography, right? The the eight I think what yeah. the eight lives of Annie Besant. So I mean, someone nine has lives, written nine lives. Nine lives, sorry, well, <laughs> a, a thousand pages on on Besant's life, and, and yet you also have someone like Richard Kitan who. Um, I will admit, I'd, I'd never heard of before uh, reading your book. Uh, how do you balance out these accounts between people who are very well known? I mean, like a mirror ben so, alongside what's... Huh. Yeah, so obviously you tell new things about them. So, uh, you know, in Meera Ben's case, uh, she was more than a... She's portrayed in Indian nationalist hagiography as Bapuki Beti, the devoted mm -hmm. daughter of Gandhi. So, uh, you know, her uh, romantic eng 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 entanglement with a... Bearded revolutionary Pitwising Azad is erased from the nationalist narrative. Narrative. Her work after Gandhi died, promoting environmental sustainability in the Himalaya, is unknown. So you can even with so-called well-known people, you can discover interesting things. I mean, and Ali Besant, I think, is largely forgotten. I mean, specialists may know about her, and mm -hmm. theosophists in Chennai may know about her, but she's an incredibly colorful character. And I think her life, her involvement first in spirituality and then in politics. And then, of course, her breach with Gandhi and her outrage at being upstaged by Gandhi uh, in the leadership of the freedom movement, I think makes for a story that had to be told again. So even those people who are, were once moderately well-known, 
like Ali Besant and Meera Ben. I think the, you can, the, ar- the archives that are now available can ha- throw fresh light on them. I, 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 I take us back to what you earlier said about you know, renaming uh, streets or chokes after people. I think Annie Besant in many ways suffers that fate. I mean, she's been reduced to AB in, in a place like Bombay, AB Road or AB Chok or, or something like that, which is yeah. a fate which I think uh, many other figures uh, also suffer from. Um, so, you, you, you know, I mean, the, the story that you've outlined here, you know, all these figures uh, coming from abroad, um, and as you mentioned, there are many others who, you have, who you've left out, people like Laurie Baker, C.F. Andrews, or, or there are many others who I'm thinking of. I mean, b- people even after independence, like J.B.S. Haldane, uh, the, the scientist who, who came across over here, and of course, we, we now have a, a great biography on him, as you mentioned, by Saman Subramaniam, uh, or someone like Otto Koenigsberger, you know, a, a German architect yes. and city planner who came to India and, and did so much, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, in places like Jamshedpur or Mysore, Mysore State. What explains all of this foreign talent coming to India. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, I could, you know, we, we see parallels with places like, say, maybe the Soviet Union, or of course, the United States, but the United States at least is, is, a, is an immigrant society. But it, it's more difficult to think of people um, yeah. coming to a country like India or, say, China or, or Japan uh, to such a great degree. And yet you have it here in, in India at a time when the country is extremely poor and, uh, you know, morally... Yes. Uh, you know, in in a situation where it's struggling against uh, British colonialism and you're impoverished on so many degrees. What was unique about India and attracting all of this? I think one of the things that attracted them was, of course, uh, the civilizational depth, despite the current poverty, the civilizational depth. Another was the open-mindedness of the freedom struggle. I mean, my book carries epigraphs from Gandhi and Tagore. And Gandhi and Tagore were two great Indian patriots who did not turn their back on the world, but embraced what was best of other cultures. Uh, Tagore particularly traveled restlessly both in the West and in the East. Uh, And I think uh, those were times in which Indian thinkers, Indian activists were much more welcoming of interaction with other kinds of people. Uh, So I think... uh, it would be hard to see this happen now. You know, it would be, hard, it would be very hard to see this happen now. I mean, of this kind of engagement. Uh, I think with Japan, it was there. I have not studied Japanese society, but Japan was so very different from the West that after it started opening out in the 1860s and 70s, you had through the late 19th, early 20th centuries, people going, and not just uh, not just uh, Westerners, but even Indians. I mean, right. for example, Raj Bihari Bose, the revolutionary mm-hmm. who stayed on in Japan, and uh, who's... Uh, Descendants became a culinary chefs and so on. So Japan had that had that attraction, you know. To the, uh, though, of course, briefly uh, in, in the Second World War, when they joined with the Nazis, they lost that kind of luster. But India and Japan was seen as uh, uh, exotic cultures with an allure, with a great history and civilizational ethos that was different from the West. And in India's case, I think people like Gandhi and Tagore. Uh, was central in attracting these kinds of foreigners to work in India. So many of these rebels were custodians of, of Gandhi's legacy after his assassination in 1948. Um, you know, those, those people who, who stayed on, as, as you mentioned in your book, uh, people, again, like Meera Ben or Sarla Devi or, um, I mean, a little bit different, someone like Philip Spratt. Um, the account you paint of... Uh, India in the 1950s and 1960s showed quite a vibrant uh, ashram yes. life in the sense that, you know, the ashrams that Gandhi helped found or indirectly founded or his followers founded seem to still be thriving. And, and yet today, the situation seems very different. I mean, as I think you pointed out in one or two other books, um, you know, the ashram culture has kind of gone into, into almost terminal decline. Um, Gandhi's legacy uh, is itself at quite a low point, right, in, in terms of, uh, you know, both very much political and, and popularly. Um, why, you know, why is this the case? I mean, you, you've, I, I think you've, you've, you've in, in, in one article or interview, you, you blamed Gandhians uh, themselves. Uh, well, there are multiple um, reasons. I think, hmm. um, uh, you know, I've written several newspaper columns about this, but it requires much deeper and a more thorough study about the decline of Gandhi in his homeland. Why has his homeland abandoned Gandhi? Uh, is it that the followers didn't do enough? Is that the rival tendencies have acquired political and ideological power, both of the left and the right? Uh, is it that he's more appreciated abroad? You know, it may be like the Buddha, uh, Gandhi will be rejected by India, but affirmed in other parts of the world. Uh, mm. So it's it's something that I've been mulling over, puzzling about, thinking about. Uh, it, I mean, it is, but it is true. I mean, it's uh, 
Uh, it's very easy to do with the corruption of the Gandhi family. Uh, the, the Congress Congress Party, the incompetence and nepotism of the Congress Party run by a family that accidentally carries the surname Gandhi. So there are many, many reasons. But we do need Gandhi. I mean, I mean, maybe this is not the place to talk about why India needs Gandhi today. But to confront its many challenges and overcome uh, its many problems, India needs Gandhi as much now, even more now than when he was alive. But sadly, there aren't enough activists and politicians and thinkers and social workers taking his legacy forward. Do, do you see any signs of a revival? I mean, particularly at this political moment. I mean, we've, we've had people reach back, uh, you know, for example, you know, with the anti-CA protests, the constitution, uh, you know, refigured as, as kind of a, a symbol. I mean, do, do you see any... Uh, I think it should, particularly when it comes to Hindu-Muslim harmony, he is vital and indispensable. And that's why in the anti-CA pro protests, it was very hard thing to see Ambedkar and Gandhi, who are sometimes represented as adversaries together, you know. So uh, Ambedkar, of course, one needs for social justice, fraternity and other things. But particularly uh, Hindu-Muslim harmony and also linguistic pluralism. You know, I live in South India, where, mm. uh, you know, Hindi imposition is, uh, is uh, not uh, viewed with kindly. Also just freedom of choice and so on and so forth. So I think nonviolence, civility and courtesy in public debate, which Gandhi practiced always. So the very environmentalism, he was a precocious environmentalist and warned against greed and overconsumption. So India needs Gandhi. It needs other people too. It needs Ambedkar, it needs Tagore, it needs Vivekananda, it needs Daurozhi, uh, you know, it needs Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. Uh, it, it needs many, many other uh, uh, great uh, visionaries too. But it would be an extraordinary pity if after having turned its back on the Buddha, India was to turn its back on them. Mm -hmm. I I agree, and in in, in many ways, at least, uh, you know, I, you know, I mean, Gandhi uh, Gandhi has been appropriated, or uh, attempts are being made to appropriate Gandhi to a very different political cu culture and political legacy, and uh, it's it's worrying to see even in you know Gandhi's home turf, places like Ahmedabad, how uh, right. that has gone without much resistance. Um, so, um, you know, as, as we kind of conclude this, this episode, I want, I want to uh, return to the subject of Indian biographies and uh, talk to you about uh, your, your Indian Live series. Uh, wh what is the status right now on, on the series? Why, you know, what, what, what impelled you towards uh, directing the series and uh, wh what do you envision uh, from it? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, can we just pause for a minute? Absolutely. This series, Indian Lives, uh, was, um, I thought of it partly because, uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, um, they are these, what we've already talked about, there's such a range of interesting and unusual characters waiting to be written about from all phases in our history and all walks of our life. They are now fine scholars willing to take the plunge and become biographers. Uh, there is an audience and a market for it. And I thought as uh, I'm now in my mid-60s, I probably don't have many books to write myself, but I can, uh, you know, work with other younger and smarter and more energetic people write their books. So I thought of this series, Indian, uh, Indian Lives, and I wanted to make sure that the subjects were interesting and the writers were qualified. So I didn't want uh, either pop historians who don't do primary research, nor did I want narrow-minded academic historians who only write for their peers. I wanted rigorous scholarship married to accessible and elegant prose, and I was able to, I, I was able to find lots of people, Indians as well as non-Indians, uh, who met these uh, twin criteria. So the first three books in the series, which are already done and in, in, uh, have been written and are in the process of being revised, are by the great... Uh, scholar uh, of uh, ancient India, or originally Sri Lankan, J.P. Olivelle, who's uh, written on Ashoka, the fine historian of, uh, of Kashmir, uh, Chitaleka Zuchi, who's written a life of Sheikh Abdullah, and uh, uh, your uh, Harvard uh, senior, I believe, Nico Slate, who, who's right. written a wonderful book on Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, uh, who's, of course, a very, uh, very interested in cross-cultural history and Kamla Devi's life such as India, America, China, Japan, Europe, and so on and so forth. And all three books are first day. I mean, I've read all three. And uh, uh, they will be published by HarperCollins in India and hopefully or by some, uh, some good university press abroad. But about the books, I won't mention the authors of the forthcoming books, but I'll mention the subjects. So three books are in. Nico Slate on Kamla Devi, 
Patrick Oliver and Ashoka and Chitraleka Joshi and Sheikh Abdullah. All interesting and uh, absolutely fascinating characters. And these books are groundbreaking. Even if I say so myself as the editor of the series, I'm this is an objective judgment based on my reading their manuscripts. But then uh, distinguished scholars from across India and the world have been commissioned to write on the great astrophysicist Subramanian Chandrasekhar, on the Adivasi leader Jaipal Singh, on Bal Gangadhar Tilak of Pune, Maharashtra and India, on the buccaneering entrepreneur Ramkrishna Dalmia, on Jayaprakash Narayan, uh, on um, the uh, Kerala social reformer Narayana Guru, uh, on uh, the medieval poet, South Indian poet Bilhana, on um, the 19th century explorer Nain Singh Rawat, on uh, uh, the, uh, the medieval North Indian medieval diarist and poet Anand Ram Muklis, on the Maharashtrian feminist writer Durga Bhagwat, on Kasturba Gandhi, on Jyotiba and Savitri Fule together. So these are some of the examples of books that have been commissioned. And where I've identified the writers, the writers are on board. And my the idea is that these first three books will come out next year. And every year uh, f- uh, thereafter, two or three books will, come, will, will appear. So about, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the next decade, we can have about 25 such Indian lives. Uh, and each life is fascinating and interesting in itself. But it's also a window into the history of the time. So I think I am confident based on these three books that have come in and the scholars who have graciously agreed to write and their credibility and their past accomplishments that these will be enduring works of scholarship as well as very readable uh, and evocative about their particular subjects. And it, it, it seems from the, the individuals you listed, you, you have people from you know a, a wide variety. I mean, all the all the way back from individuals like Ashoka, right, all the way up into uh, modern figures like Dalmia or or J.P. Narayan and such. And importantly, a lot of women. I mean, we, we, one one notices especially in India, um, women get yes. effaced from so much of the history. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge I face whenever I teach my history courses, how to bring in more of women's history. Uh, and so I think, you know, I mean, it's it's incredible in a certain way that someone like, um, you know, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay or, or uh, you know, Sarojini Naidu have until recently not had much, you know, scholarship written on them. It's, so it's among the women I have not mentioned so far who are, will be in the series are Sarojini Naidu, whom you mentioned, and Hansa Mehta, uh, yes. Uh, 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 confirmed and possibly Razia Sultana as well, but that's not confirmed. So oh, I was very keen that yeah. one would have, you know, uh, some of the most remarkable women represented. I may even at some stage um, think of, uh, of obviously mostly producing new books, but if they are classic works uh, that are out of print, those can be reprinted in this series as classics. Hmm. For example, uh, uh, you know, there have been some outstanding feminist uh, biographies that have been written that are now out of print. I won't mention them. But if one can get permission, one can, you know, bring them back with a new introduction and and so on. But essentially, these will be new books. uh, And I will not have Tagore, Gandhi, Nehru. I don't want, because there's so much about them, you know. So I I was clear that these three, at least, I don't want a new life of Tagore or Gandhi or Nehru in this series. What what advice would you give to a a young scholar uh, contemplating taking up a biographical subject, you know, in in a PhD program or or post-PhD? Well, choose your subject uh, to someone whom uh, you want to spend several years with. Remember, you are... uh, submerging your life in somebody else's life. You're, that person is more important to you than your story. So choose someone you want to live with for three or five or seven years. Maybe not seven years, but a good, I mean, obviously Gandhi is someone that I live, have lived with all my life, but Elwin or these, or, or this book I've written about, uh, the seven characters I've written about, generally three to five years is what you would need to invest in a, a work of a rigorous scholarship, whether biographical or otherwise. So choose a person you want to live with, Choose a person about whom the sources exist. Choose a person who, as I said, is a a window into their times. Uh, You know, a life uh, of a university professor would be very boring. A life (laughs) of a lawyer who does commercial law and only does commercial briefs would be deadly dull to read, even if that lawyer has made a great deal of money. Uh, So choose a subject who sheds light on many other things and who's interesting in herself or himself, on whom there are sources, 
and who you are personally attracted to or you personally detest. Obviously, you know, there's so many books on Hitler. People are not writing about Hitler because they like Hitler, right? But they, they recognize his historical significance. But generally, it's people you want to live with. Like you wanted to spend these years with Naroji. For, I mean, you wanted to spend these years with Naroji, I suspect, for a combination of personal and intellectual reasons. They were not only personal, nor were they only intellectual. They were a mix. And that's normally the case. That should be the case. I was interested in Adivasis and Elvin changed my life. Both. Right. So I think uh, this is some of the... And, it, you know, and I would just say one last thing. Think of writing a biography at at least one biography at some stage of your career. You don't have to become a professional biographer who only churns out biographies. You know, write social history, cultural history, institutional history, write different kinds of books. I myself have written different kinds of books. I mean, I'm not... I've written several biographies, but I, that, that's not all that I do. But writing a biography is something uh, a historian should try and do at some stage of their career, you know, either early or in the middle or at the end. I think it's hugely enjoyable and educative, and it's a different dimension to the historian's craft uh, that, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, that you'll be provided. And I, I, as I think you've mentioned elsewhere, it is in many ways an extremely difficult form of, of, of uh, a literary form. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult genre to, to master. I mean, there's so many different factors you have to input into, uh, you know, the story of someone's life. What you say about living with the subject, I think, resonates particularly with me, because at least when I was uh, writing and, and researching my own work on Naroji, I mean, I was living with him to such a degree that I would have a recurring dream that there was a, uh, there, there were a series of, of microfilms of, of uh, <laughs> archival documents that I had not discovered that I just stumbled upon as you know I finished working on my manuscript. So I, I, I definitely agree with you in the sense that you have to pick a subject who you want to live with right. because they do enter your life in, in many ways. Yeah. The last question I want to ask you is, um, what, what are you currently reading? I mean, what, what books, uh, I mean, you've talked a little bit about the manuscripts you've, 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 uh, you've read. Uh, what books would you recommend uh, to uh, people, <laughs> not just what, academically, but, you know, uh, uh, people I in general? Have, it's, that's a very hard question for me to answer. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because I read in a very eclectic and unstructured fashion. I read a lot of essays. Uh, I started reading fiction, uh, which I didn't read for many years. I uh, So I've been reading uh, the writer Barbara Pym, who's a, a, a British writer of the last century. I've been reading Tolstoy. I've been reading George Eliot. I haven't been actually reading many scholarly works of late. You know, I've been reading more fiction and more kind of um, other kinds of stuff. I see. Okay, good. Good. No, I mean that's that's something which I struggle with also balancing fiction and non-fiction. In fact, my wife has been telling me to read more fiction instead of the books that keep on piling on my desk from academic publishers. Uh, so, thank you very much, Ram, for being here today, for taking the time out to speak. It's been it's been wonderful to talk to you about biography and your most recent book. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. You were listening to Past Imperfect, a special podcast series by SPGIMR. Brought to you by SPJMR's Center for Wisdom and Leadership. Produced by Vinita Dvivedi.